This is the Wall Street for Main Street radio podcast, your number one destination for financial news, information, and education with no strings attached. Be sure to check out our other podcasts and articles at www.wallstreetformainstreet.com. Now, here are your hosts, Jason Burak, Mo Dawood, and John Manfreda. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Wall Street for Main Street podcast. My name is Mo Darude, and today's special guest is Joe Mayer. He is the editor of the Straight Money Analysis newsletter. Joe, thank you for joining us. Good evening, Mo. Thank you for having me as a guest this evening. It's a pleasure to visit with you and your listening audience. Oh, the pleasure is ours. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Joe, before we get started in discussing the economy, the market, and other stuff, uh, why don't you tell our listeners your background for those people that haven't heard about you from before? Well, I became a public investor in 1966 and went up on Wall Street as a professional in 1972 and have been part of the industry ever since. I've been a stockbroker, professional money manager, arbitrator, mediator with both the New York Stock Exchange and FINRA, and as you know, a newsletter writer since 2009. Okay, that's great. So you were in Wall Street back in the 70s. Uh, how different was Wall Street uh, was back in the 70s compared to today? Well, I think when we talk about the products that are sold, certainly by the major firms, there's a lot more products than certainly we, we certainly had available to, available to us in the 1970s. I think the market dynamics have changed. We certainly have much more volatility than we've ever witnessed, certainly going back to prior decades. And I think the ability of investors to be part of these markets and certainly participate in them has never been greater. But I think markets, as I've always said, represent risk and reward, and I think every investor has to approach the market with a very solid game plan. And it seems like Wall Street today is more short-term thinking than what it was before, where there were uh, more longer-term uh, investors. Um, but back then, uh, Wall Street used to invest in business and help them grow. And today, now they're more interested in trying to make a quick buck. And if you look at the investment banking, uh, their biggest department is the trading department. Why? Because that's where they make all of their money. Very uh, true. Trading and the high-frequency trading as well. Well, we've never had the swing, certainly both up and down, that we've had in this bull market, certainly in in prior markets. I think the investor comes into the market with a very short-term viewpoint of what he wants the market to do. No longer do we look at value and accumulate it and buy it for the long term until the market certainly value a situation and value it fairly and then begin the process. Most people, as I've said, have a short-term horizon. Serious money in the market all through my career, Mo, has been made over a period of two to three years. Oh, wow. Uh, do you believe that the uh, the shift in how Wall Street uh, think has impacted the market? Because uh, nowadays we're seeing a lot more volatility in the commodity market and the stock market due to the high frequency trading, uh, more trading done by investment banking, and also the uh, interest rate manipulation and how the Federal Reserve is artificially popping up the stock market. All those things you've said are absolutely true, but we've never seen more leverage certainly utilized in these markets than we have over the last couple of years. We've got very heavy foreign intervention in these markets. We're in a global economy, in a global market, and that's the reason why we can see a couple of hundred point swings both up and down. And yeah, so let's just give here and talk about uh, what's going on in the with the euro currency right now. The hot debate is what's going on in Greece. Uh, a lot of experts and pundits on Main Street and in Wall Street and around the world, etc., are predicting that possibly the uh, exit for the Greece from the European Union. Um, do you think that's going to happen? And if so, what impact would that have on a euro currency and the country that are part of the EU and that are using the euro currency, like Germany? Well, I think we're reaching a crisis, certainly, with Greece. I think when we talk about the problems with Greece, as I've said, it's the tip of the iceberg. 
We've got other problems within the European Union. As you know, we've got Greece, which is on the front burner, but we also have Portugal and Spain, and we've certainly got uh, Italy as well that are in trouble. You know, I question whether or not the European Union itself will survive, and I question whether or not Germany will continue to fund what's necessary to keep Greek, Greece solvent. And that's a good point that, that you mentioned that the other countries are in the same boat as Greece, uh, such as Italy and Portugal and Spain. It's just that, that they have a longer, uh, longer leech, uh, so to say, than Greece. Could, uh, Greece had been, uh, bailed out multiple times, and I think, uh, countries like Germany have had enough and just rather see Greece just lead the Euro rather than, uh, give them, uh, more bailout money. Well, I think there's a possibility we could see a breakup of the European Union and certainly the euro itself. And I've said many times I don't rule out the possibility as to the members of the European Union uh, reverting back to their own sovereign currency. And what impact do you think that would have on Greece uh, if they do leave the euro? Um, I mean, their, their, their economy is already in, in deep trouble. Um, so... Staying with the euro or leaving the euro, um, they pretty much had to hit the bottom regardless. Well, I think it'll bring continued turmoil to the European markets, but let's not lose sight that uh, Greece certainly has two major partners now that are going to certainly be at their side as they move forward. That's China and Russia. So this is a much different scenario certainly than what we had two or three years ago, Mo. Uh, yeah, I agree. It'll be interesting to see what happens for the next few weeks. Uh, it's a lot of rumors out there, a lot of discussion about giving uh, Greece a 50% haircut, um, uh, and a lot of discussion about just kicking them out of the euro altogether. So the next few to three weeks will be a major turning point, I believe, for the future of the European Union. I think you're absolutely right. The next couple of weeks will tell the story on Greece one way or the other. Okay, great. So uh, let's shift gears here and talk about the U.S. equity market uh, in general. Um, as of today, uh, the U.S. stock market has pretty much been sideways lately. Um, but overall, ever since the 2008 crisis and the Federal Reserve uh, bailout and the government bailout and the stimulus and the QE, uh, the stock market has been pretty much artificially popped up, uh, get, uh, gained double-digit uh, return annually ever since the crisis. Uh, do you believe the stock market in general is overvalued? Well, I think I've got three immediate concerns. I think the market's extremely overvalued. I think it's widely overextended, and I think we've got rampantly euphoric sediment. All these things lead me to believe the market may be approaching a major top. Doesn't mean we can't go higher, but I think as we go higher, people should be selling into any further rally mode and taking money off the table, raise some cash. Yeah, sell high and, and buy low, right? Absolutely. Uh, so why do you think the uh, the stock market is overvalued? Uh, uh, if you look at uh, the sector in the stock market, um, are there any stock market, any uh, sectors or industry in the stock market that you think are undervalued in this uh, crowd of uh, overvalued market? Well, I think when we look at U.S. stocks on a cyclical adjusted price earnings index, or what we call the cap index, it's roughly now at 27. The historical average is about 17. And if we go back to Black Tuesday in 1929, the index was right around 30. So I think this market is somewhat frothy. I think it's a little bit tired. And as you know, we've not had a 10% correction now in, in, in three and a half years. So I think this market is certainly setting up at some point uh, for a correction. And I think it may be deeper and more severe than most people want to believe. And yeah, and I was looking at the uh, S&P 100 put call ratio, and it indicated that the market has stopped with a bearish reading of at least uh, 0.2. That it hit the 0.2 uh, put the call ratio 34 times this year, and historically that means the market has stopped and it's ready for major correction. So that's one indicator right there that the market is is ripe 
for a correction, but it's been ripe for a correction for the uh, last couple of years, and it hasn't happened yet. You know, another uh, indicator that I followed over the years is the Dow Jones utility average, and it topped out in January right around 650, and it's been correcting ever since, and it's always been an indicator of putting a bottom in place, or more importantly, the turning point uh, on a long-term top. The indicator can be early by a month and, is, and can lag by as much as 10 months, but that indicator is warning that we are approaching at some point, probably in the next several months, a major top of significant importance that will lead to a massive decline and or a beginning of a bear market mull. And there, there's a lot of indicators out there that, that calling for a correction in the stock market, uh, but due to the government uh, Intervention in the Federal Reserve, uh, they have kicked the can down the road on a correction. And I, I believe the next correction could could be worse than 2008 because there's so many bubbles forming uh, right now uh, compared to the, the uh, pre-2008 financial crisis that just uh, could make this next uh, economic turmoil even worse than 2008. Well, that's the reason why I think you sell into any further rallies, you raise some cash, you await the correction, and you put money back to work into the market at better values. So let me ask you, so how can investors on Main Street diversify in its current condition uh, of the market? Say that question one more time, Mo, I didn't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. How can investors on Main Street diversify in its current condition as of today? Well, I think you've got to take a, a highly defensive position in the market. I think you've got to look at the economic staples. You've got to look at the foods, the beverages, certainly the tobacco stocks. I think you've got to look on a total return basis by the quality names, by the low PEs uh, in these different sectors and put them away. I think you've got to look at this market at some point entering a serious decline it may be the beginning of a bear market. It just may be a correction in an ongoing bull market, and we turn around and go significantly higher. But this has been a momentum, liquidity-driven rally. There's no question there's a tremendous amount of liquidity in this market, and this market wants to go higher. I haven't ruled out that we could see possibly 20,000 in the Dow. As you know, the Dow likes round numbers. We, we, we had trouble getting over 1,000 going back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and then we got above 1,000. We had problems at 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. So the next round number, I think, which is going to be a magnet for the Dow if we continue upwards, would be 20,000. Having said that, if we were to see 20,000, I think at that point you would have to raise some serious cash and step aside and await, which I would believe at that point, the onset of a bear market mo. Yeah, and if the Dow Jones reached twenty thousand, I, uh, I'll, I'll be on the sideline as well because um, that uh, bull market that's gone way past its limit, um, and that could make the neck correction even worse. Well, if typical it goes, if it goes, markets going all the way back to nineteen hundred have lasted on average about four point nine years. As you know, this bull market is now over six years old. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we can't go higher or this bull market can't last longer. But I think the risk-reward of being in this market now, I think the upside is very limited, and I think the downside is very great. And I think, yeah, I think to the Federal Reserve, there's been more frequent boom and bust in the economy uh, due to their manipulation of the money supply and the interest rates. Uh, if you look past the past, if you look at the past uh, 20 years, we had the tech. Uh, dot com bubble in 2000, and then eight years later we have the 2008 crisis, and it seems like uh, ne next couple of years we could be doing another crisis, and it seems like we're frequently getting into an uh, economic crisis more often. And if you look at uh, the correlation between the Federal Reserve and the boom and bust, uh, that theory is pretty valid. Well, I think when you take a look at the amount of money that's been pumped into the system, as you know, the Fed balance sheet in 2007 was right around $800 billion. The Fed balance sheet currently now is in excess of $4 trillion. A tremendous amount of that money has come into these financial markets. I don't think there's any question of that. 
I think the question everyone is asking themselves is not if interest rates will go up, but at what point will they? And I think the greatest risk, and I'm, I'm very leery of these equity markets at these levels, but I think the greatest risk right now is in the bond market. I don't know whether you agree with that, but that's the way I see it. Oh, I agree. There is a, a lot of risks in the bond market. Uh, the, one of the bubbles forming right now is in the bond market, along with the student loan uh, bubble, uh, the reinflated housing bubble, and the derivative bubble. There's a lot of bubbles forming right now in the market, which make uh, the future uh, very scary. Well, I think it's a time for caution. I think it's a time for reflection. It's a time to nail down some profits and not have them evaporate uh, in the correction when it sets in. And again, I think you raise some cash and you wait for a better buying opportunity and or entry level into the market. So if the Federal Reserve do uh, raise the rate, um, what impact do you think they'll have on the stock market and the economy? Well, I think that if they do raise rates, which I think at some point they will, they're going to raise them very slowly. And I think initially it won't have the shock and effect that a lot of people would want to believe you know, would affect the markets. But the biggest problem with the Fed is they start to raise rates slowly and they tend to keep raising them. And at some point, I think people become alarmed that we're going to see possibly a credit crunch very similarly to what we had witnessed going back in prior cycles. I'm hoping that's not the case. The Fed has been very accommodative. They've been very loose monetarily. I'm just hoping, Mo, they don't swing the other way and tighten and tighten excessively when they do decide to raise rates. That's my concern. Yeah, that's what they did uh, previous to the 2008 financial crisis when they raised the rate um, pretty much every year up to the crisis, and that's what led to the uh, pop in the housing bubble. Very true. Okay, great. So uh, one of the markets that you do follow and that we talk about frequently on our podcast is the precious metals market. So I want to get your uh, insight on that. Uh, do you believe the bull market and the gold and uh, the bull market and the gold and silver market is over, or just just a, uh, a break on our way to our our next phase in the bull market? I believe the precious metal bull market is alive and well. I'll further say I think the precious metal bull market's maybe half over at best. And this is the sixth time in 200 years that we've had a super cycle commodity bull. You know, you go back to the first one, which was 1812, the second one, which was the Civil War, the third one, World War I, the fourth one, World War II in Korea, the fifth one, the Cold War, and now the sixth time in 200 years, the War on Terror. I know the precious metals have been disappointing. I know the correction that we had from the highs has very, been very severe and painful. But I think we're very close to a long-term bottom and a turning point in the metals and I'm looking for significantly higher uh, both gold and silver prices as we move forward. Yeah, and with the demand from the east side has continued to remain strong. Uh, I read an article recently that the gold demand in India is up 20% so far this year uh, compared to last year. And my sources told me that the uh, demand in China for gold and silver remains steady despite reports out there. I mean, it's not as hot as it was a couple of years ago, but the demand out there is still steady and people in China are still buying. So, and if you look at what's going on in this country, uh, people are still buying the silver and gold uh, mint coins. So to me, I think the bull market is still alive. It's just unfortunate because the uh, gold and silver market is being, the price is being uh, regulated and manipulated by, I think, by in the paper market. Uh, so, Well, the paper I, markets are not the physical market. There's very little physical and gold available for sale uh, in the market. People lose sight of the fact that China is now the largest gold producer in the world and has been for a couple of years having surpassed South Africa. And more importantly, China and all the central banks of the world continue to accumulate gold. China at this point has not announced in several years their gold holdings. They announced them roughly every seven or eight years. And the last time China reported their gold holdings, they reported 3,300 tons. I believe that over the last several years, China has now accumulated somewhere between 20 and 25,000 tons. 
and if I am right on that, and I have no reason to believe I'm not, they would be holding currently at that level three times the total gold reserves of the U.S. Fed. Uh, yeah, in the U.S. It reportedly had around 8,000 tons. And 300 that, tons. I'm sorry, 300 tons. And with that prediction, uh, yeah, that's three times as much as what U.S. has. Who knows how much U.S. has, uh, to be honest. Uh, I've been audited it, the gold reserves at Fort Knox since 1953. That was the last audit during the Korean War. Most people don't know that. Yeah, that's right. And there's a lot of rumors out there that uh, the Chinese want to uh, make their currency one of the reserve currencies uh, as part of the FDR as well, as a basket of reserve currency. And for them to do that, they're going to have to report uh, the gold reserve holdings. So hopefully pretty soon within, hopefully within this year, we'll find out how much gold they have. I think it's going to be a shock to the market when it is reported that they've been able to accumulate that much gold. Russia continues to accumulate gold as well as India. And China, as you know, is sitting on about $3 trillion of U.S. denominated assets. And they're moving very heavily now into the energy sector globally. And more importantly, they continue to buy on any weakness, both gold and silver, that's available. But on a long-term basis, when you talk about the precious metals market, Mo, there's no question silver is now the most undervalued asset on the face of the earth, and it should be bought and put away. Yep, gold, silver, I think uh, oil as well is very undervalued. I think oil in the long term, you know, we've had five periods where oil prices have doubled within a five-year period of time. And most people lose sight of that, but I'd like to name them quickly going back to the prior times when we did see oil prices double within a two-year time period. January 1974, November 1979, September 1980, June of 2000, August of 2005, and December of 2008. So I think at these levels here, roughly in the mid-$50 area, I think two years out, we could see oil back over $100 a barrel very easily. Oh, I agree. I don't think oil prices can stay just low forever. If you consider the production costs for pulling the oil out of the ground nowadays, uh, the shell oil, they need 70 to $80 uh, to make it economical to uh, pull the oil out of the ground. And if you look at the offshore oil drilling, uh, they need... Uh, oil prices to be high for them to make uh, money pulling uh, the oil out of the deep sea. And then if you look at uh, in Saudi Arabia and Russia, a lot of their tax revenue comes from oil and they fund a lot of the social program using the oil revenue. So they need oil prices to be high as well. So I don't think the oil price is going to stay that low as well. So I agree with you. I think a lot of the oil producing nations need a minimum of eighty, ninety dollar a barrel oil to fund the social programs of their economy. Oh yeah, I agree. I think Iran needs uh, at least one hundred and twenty. I read one hundred and twenty dollars uh, per barrel for them to. I believe you're right. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. Well, Joe, thank you for coming on for Wall Street for Made Three podcast. If people want to find out more about your uh, newsletter, where can they go? Go to the straightmoneyanalysis.com website. We've got a sample newsletter on the website under the newsletter icon. The newsletter is quarterly. I'll be writing and sending out the June issue uh, on the 1st of June. I write about the economy, the stock and bond markets, precious metals, both gold and silver. I write a commentary in every issue on the energy sector, both crude oil and natural gas. And we also have extensive commentary on Fed monetary policy. Okay, great, Joe. Well, thank you for coming on, and hopefully you can come back on again soon. I want to thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure, and I'm always here for you to visit with your listening audience anytime you would like to have me.